Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Lunch in the Garden series here. My name is David Chinnery, and I'm getting ready to share my slides here. Um, I'm from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County. And we have today as our engineer, coordinator, question answerer, co-pilot, Marcy Winaka. And um, we'll be recording this for our YouTube uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension channel in case you miss any of it. And um, it's gonna be fun because this is one of my favorite subjects. So today we're gonna be talking about easy to grow flowering trees and shrubs. And I'm all, I'm glad you're all here uh, to join me today. We'll try to keep it towards a half an hour. I, of course, being a plant person, have a million trees and shrubs I like. And I to really narrow this down to uh, just a few. We could probably do four weeks of Wednesday Lunch in the Garden um, series programs on this kind of topic. But um, I tried to pick things that are gonna be flowering soon. So these are mostly flowering uh, trees and shrubs things you're gonna really wanna grow because they have beautiful flowers in the springtime. So uh, just a little promo here before we get started. On our Facebook page, we have Plant of the Week every week. We also have Gardening Update, which is a little um, video I do on Fridays that talks about some of the gardening issues, problems, challenges, wonderful things that happen every week. So look for that on Fridays on our Facebook page. And if you'd like to be signed up to get the emails about these webinars, as well as other uh, things we're doing in the horticulture program, send an email to me, dhc3 at cornell.edu. And I'll show this again at the end of the program. So without further ado, who are these plants? Well, for the most part, these are all gonna be pest resistant plants. I didn't pick anything that was too uh, problematic as far as pests go. They should all be hardy in our area, zone five, and some of them into zone four. Most of these are gonna be um, easy to find. There's gonna be a few that are gonna be difficult to find in the nursery trade. I wanted to throw out a few kind of rare plants just for your amusement. Uh, remember, there are very few perfect plants. Usually people call me and they say, I want something that flowers for about a month, doesn't grow too tall, doesn't have any insect problems, never needs watering. You know, they come up with this list of impossible things. And if they were perfect plants, I guess we'd all just have the perfect plant. So these are all good plants, um, but no, no plants are really perfect. And of course, the performance of any plant can really vary widely from place to place. So you may grow it and have great success, and I may have perfect failure with it. So that's kind of the part of fun, part of the fun of horticulture. Uh, we're going to skip some of the very problem-prone and invasive plants. This is a tree I absolutely love. This is the pagoda dogwood, it's a native tree to our area, um, cornice, but it gets a terrible um, canker problem, a yellow stem uh, or twig canker that kills these in a matter of weeks. So I have this uh, growing on my property, it self seeds, it becomes uh, a plant that you really wanna have, but it's killed by this uh, pathogen. And also we're not gonna really mention too many invasive plants today. And for each one of the plants I talk about, there's gonna be dozens of cultivars and varieties available in your nurseries. And I'm not gonna talk about all those. Uh, for instance, here's an oak leaf hydrangea, fantastic shrub. Um, I'll talk about it, but you're gonna find um, yellow oak leaf hydrangeas, pink flowering oak leaf hydrangeas, short ones, tall ones, all manner of variations on this um, in your nurseries. So um, do a little research and see what they have. Um, this program today is just a very basic guideline to get you started. Um, if the plant we're talking about has an American flag on its uh, slide, it's going to be native somewhere in the USA, maybe not right here, but somewhere. And if it has a deer on it, it's going to be rarely or seldom severely damaged by deer, at least by uh, the standards of a few pundits that I've read up on um, online about deer damage. Okay, so let's get started. Um, and I'll have to go fast because I can tell I've got a lot to say and I wanna to try to keep it brief. Uh, fantastic plant, the bottle brush buckeye. Um, this is a large flowering shrub. This gets a spike-like flower, a very loose kind of spike in probably June sometime. And you can see in that bottom picture, it makes a very large mound. This is a fantastic plant for edge of the woods gardens. Partial shade, 
It's got a palmately compound leaf and it grows by runners, not invasive. Um, it's just a fantastic mounding um, plant and these uh, big spikes of these flowers are really fantastic. So I have one of these in my garden just starting out and I'm very anxious to see how it does. In fact, that upper left picture is my plant. Uh, sweet shrub, calicanthus. This is an interesting little shrub native to the southeast. It's sort of a wooden or kind of a dry little flower on it, dark maroon or red. There's also, I think, white and yellow versions of this. It suckers to some degree, extremely easy to grow. Um, maybe you could keep this three, four feet tall. Does need a little pruning, but tough as nails, easy to grow. The red bud, I had to mention this one because it's one of my absolute favorites. Pea-like flowers in magenta. This again is a native plant edge of the woods, going to be uh, in flower in a couple of weeks probably, just a showstopper. And this does come in white as well. There's also other cultivars that have dark maroon leaves, different variations of this um, in the marketplace nowadays. And it's a lovely small tree, maybe 25 feet tall at the most. I think mine is probably only about 20 feet. And you can see on that picture on the left, there's a seedling. So in my yard, it self-seeds a lot, which I want to have happen because I want to have more red buds. So here's another picture. It's kind of a variable in character, but it's got that sort of open habit and these lovely um, pinkish magenta flowers. The fringe tree. This is not one you see a whole lot, but this is again, another native plant to our Southeast. These um, very fringy white flowers. Uh, this is a male and a female. Um, on separate plants type of plant. So the female will get blue fruits on it. Uh, they're not highly um, ornamental, but they're kind of interesting. The male plant supposedly has larger fringe to it. So there you go, the male is a little showier. And again, it's kind of an easy to grow plant. In the native areas, this would be kind of a woods or edge of the woods plant, but here it is growing in full sunshine. Makes kind of a large shrub or a small tree and often multi-stem. Uh, Clethra, now this is one that's really moved into the marketplace and it's kind of gone mainstream. You can find Clethra in a lot of different places now and it's become very popular. <clears throat> now, why would you wanna grow this one? Again, it's very easy to grow. I have this plant in dry shade and if you've got a large enough, well, it doesn't have to be large. If you've got a garden with dry shade, you've got places that are hard to deal with, right? Um, so my garden has a lot of dry shade to it. I'm actually growing this under a sugar maple, which is kind of an interesting place for something to grow. Not easy. In the native areas of where this grows, in the southeastern United States, this would be more of a wood, uh, edge of the woods, but damp kind of woods plant. So it's very adaptable, very tough, uh, fairly drought tolerant. It's kind of a spike-like flower that's very attractive to pollinators. So if you're Interested in pollinator plants, this is one that would be good for that. Um, easy to find in the marketplace, get some yellow fall color. So this is one that's uh, real, a good one to grow. Mine is probably six feet tall, but it could easily be kept a little shorter with a little pruning. And in my pictures here, I've got a pink one. And in the nursery trade, I know there's one called Pink Spires. And there's also one called, I think, Ruby Glow, if I'm not mistaken. So there's some that have more of a pinkish flower to them. And if you look on the internet um, about some of these pink flowered clethra, some of them are this violent dark pink, some of them are very pale pink. They all have the same names. So who knows what in reality they are. Often pictures on the internet tend to be a little colorized, but no matter what, it's just a fantastic plant. And again, this is a great pollinator plant. This will be humming with bees and other insects when it blooms. And this will be a summer bloomer. Uh, the dogwoods. Now dogwoods, we could do a whole half hour on dogwoods and not even start to cover it. But um, dogwoods are fantastic trees. The flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida, native, will be native in our area, um, up into uh, the southern part of Vermont, up into Washington County. You can find it in native undisturbed woodlands. Probably one of the premier fantastically wonderful flowering small trees we have. Again, probably 20, 25 feet tall. Uh, these bracts are really what you're seeing here uh, are in the springtime and it gets a very attractive red fruit in the fall. Attractive bark, 
So it's sort of a four season tree and um, life is wonderful when you have a dogwood. Now the only trouble is that back in the 1970s, we started to see disease issues on this dogwood. And there was a disease called um, dogwood anthracnose that came along and really killed a lot of these dogwoods, which is very unfortunate. So we don't see it sold quite as much as we used to, and we don't see it grown as much as we used to. But here's a dogwood that's in Troy, um, down the street from our office near the Methodist Church, and Marcy and I walk past this at lunchtime, and every year I just go, whoa, whoa, I get all excited about this dogwood, because it's, this is a really big one. This is bigger than 20 or 25 feet. It's been there for many years, living in that urban environment, so it's a pretty tough plant. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous uh, spring display. So a dogwood that came along that is resistant to the dogwood and thracnose is Cornus Cusa or the Cusa dogwood. Blooms a little bit later than the flowering dogwood. Has kind of an interesting berry-like fruit on it that you can see in that photo there. It's a little deer resistant um, and it's resistant to the dogwood and thracno. So it's got a white flower. There's also pink flowered ones. It's got sort of a vase shape. Fairly good size, small tree, every bit of 25 feet probably, and uh, very tough and easy to find in the trade at this point. Um, now if you're going to go buy one of these, be aware that the botany taxonomy folks have been messing with the cornus part of the name here and they've called, they're now calling some of these dogwoods benthamidia. And uh, here's a variegated one that I saw up in Maine in a garden. So if you want a very fancy one, you can buy a variegated dogwood. I'm still calling it Cornus, but you might see on some of the tags this new name, Benthamidia. So what happened was that we couldn't really grow the flowering dogwood as well. The Kusa was around, so we created a hybrid. Or I shouldn't say we. This was done by one of my professors at Rutgers, Dr. Elwin Orton, and he created the Rutgers dogwoods by crossing the flowering dogwood with the Kusa dogwood and getting a plant that was resistant to the anthracnose and still had the beautiful flowers. So these dogwoods flower later than the flowering dogwood. They flower um, kind of in between the Kusa and the, the flowering dogwood maybe. They come in pinks and whites. Here's one called Stellar Pink. They're very good growers and uh, you can probably find these in the nursery trade. I think they're starting to become more popular. So they might be called Rutgers dogwoods. There's one called Constellation. Um, they're kind of named for um, things in the sky. So look for those, they're fantastic plants. And there's Dr. Orton who developed these. Takes many, many years to do that. And he was a great teacher. So we certainly appreciate all his efforts saving the dogwoods for us. Another wonderful dogwood is the Cornelian cherry dogwood. This is a very early blooming one. You can see it has very small yellow blossoms on it. This is already passed. So uh, this will later get a large kind of uh, interesting red fruit on it that is eaten by people in the uh, Eastern Europe uh, where this grows native. The gray dogwood is a kind of a conservation plant. You can see it gets a white berry on it um, later in the late summer into the fall. This is a shrubby dogwood probably grows to about mm, six or eight feet and makes runners. So you can plant this as a conservation plant, a good wildlife plant. And then of course the red twig dogwood, one of my favorites because you have these red twigs um, that really are offset by the snow. You can get variegated types of this. And this again is a shrubby dogwood, maybe six feet tall and prune out the old stems when they turn brown to uh, get it to grow new red stems. Uh, the smoke bush, just have to mention that one. Whoops, too, a little too fast there. There was one planted on the High Line down in New York City, pruned into a poodle. It's kind of a little debasing for a dignified plant. Here we've got one with a panicle hydrangea. Lovely dark red foliage. You can get these in green as well, but it's a great grower, easy to grow. It could be a small tree if you prune it that way, maybe mm, 10, 12 feet tall, something like that, or you can cut it back and have it maintained as a shrub. And look at the textures of these plants in this garden. You don't need flowers here. Um, and the smoke tree does make sort of a smoke like inflorescence, but that's not really the point. It's that wonderful foliage. Father Gilla, this is kind of a bottle brush shrub. The large Father Gilla maybe gets to about 10 feet. The dwarf one will be much shorter. I have the dwarf one in my garden. 
It hasn't exceeded, I think, four or five feet in probably seven or eight years. This will bloom in the springtime. You get this bottle brush uh, foliage effect. Really great fall color on this plant. And again, a native one um, to the southeast and can actually grow in slightly damp places. Another favorite of mine is the Carolina Silver Bell. This is a tree that is in my backyard. It will be blooming in a couple weeks probably. It's a very large white flower every year covered in these silver bells or these white bells, um, which will persist you know, for just about seven days maybe. Then they fall off and it turns into a very lovely kind of medium sized tree. I always thought of this as being small, but this guy has got to be every bit of 30, 35 feet tall now. Multi-stemmed and has wonderful kind of snake-like bark. So that's one that really isn't very well known, but a good grower in our area. Uh, the witch hazels, of course, these bloom either in the very late fall, our native one blooms in the late fall, or they bloom in the very early spring. This one's called Arnold Promise. You can see it flowering there. I took that picture in March one year. Got sort of a strapped, strapped, strapped petaled fully uh, leaf uh, flower on it. I can get it out. Uh, so this blooms before anything else. I have one in my yard called Luna, which has gotten quite large. It's a shrub, but it could be a, almost a small tree, probably about 10 feet tall. Uh, so if you want something that blooms before anything else, in February and March, you look for a witch hazel. Fascinating shrubs. Uh, the oak leaf hydrangea. Now this is a beautiful plant. I have never really succeeded well with this one. I'm sure some of you on this uh, webinar have grown this better than I have. It's got this really coarse, textured, bold foliage. So you can see it in these pictures here. Um, if you want a dainty plant, this is not it. This is a very coarse textured plant, Quercifolia oak leaf. It looks just like it says, right? Uh, so it's got sort of a cone-shaped white flower. I think it does come in pink flowers now. And you can see there's some good uh, fall color there. A lot of people say this is not hard to grow. I haven't really succeeded with it. Um, I think we're kind of on the edge of its northern um, habitat, if you will. So uh, give it a little bit of shelter, I think, and uh, you may have success with it. And I could spend, again, a lot of time talking about hydrangeas. I just threw one other one in here. Uh, this is a uh, panicle hydrangea, hydrangea paniculata tardiva. Um, this is a very large shrub. We saw this up in Maine a couple years ago. And these hydrangeas are just the po most popular thing in the world. Uh, people love hydrangeas. They've become a big seller in the nursery industry now. And of course, with a shrub like this, this has got to be, you know, six, well, more than six, probably eight, ten feet tall. You've got to give it enough room. So make sure when you're planting these that you do Read the tags and do a little research and, and give these plants enough room because there's nothing worse than trying to jam things in uh, when they don't have enough space. I'm guilty of that myself. Uh, the winterberry holly. I know some folks on the uh, webinar today grow this one. I grow this one as well. This can be a wet site plant. This will grow naturally in swampy areas. Even in Rensselaer County, we have this native and it makes a wonderful orange fruit on it. It's a deciduous holly, a holly that loses all its leaves in the fall, and you have these bare branches with this wonderful fruit display. Now the ones in my yard, uh, the fruit does get eaten by birds, which is kind of what nature uh, should be doing, so that's okay. And you want to make sure you have at least one male for the females to get good pollination and good fruit development. And you can see from the picture there that when it has its green foliage on it, it's not really the most outstanding plant. So, um, you know, do you want this front and center in your garden or do you want to put this maybe as a backdrop? Do you want to put it somewhere uh, along the edge of the woods where you can see it in the wintertime? Um, I have uh, mine in an area that's kind of on the edge of the woods and it's not a wet spot and it's doing just fine. So winterberry holly, there's short ones, there's tall ones. You can get lots of variations on these in the nursery trade now, so um, take a look at what they're selling. Another great native is this Itea, which is a shrubby plant, maybe gets to about six feet tall. There's a variation of this called uh, Henry's Garnet that will have very red um, type twigs, and there's one called Little Henry that I've been told only gets to about three feet. So again, some of these shrubs have small variations. You can get more compact versions. 
It's got a very uh, attractive drooping sort of um, snake-like flower there. This, these pictures I took, I think, in the second week of June down in Pennsylvania. So this would be maybe the end of June for us blooming. And you can see it's got a very attractive deep wine colored foliage there in the fall. So again, one that's not really well known, but I think you might find it in nurseries. I didn't really include too many evergreens. This is a broadleaf evergreen um, that I did include though. It's called Lakothawi. It is very deer resistant. Not particularly easy plant to grow though. I should, maybe I shouldn't have put it in here because I'm not sure it's easy. This one's growing really well in April Park. Um, it is in a sheltered place. So um, it is a broadleaf evergreen, will not lose its foliage in the winter time. So give it some shelter. Um, this particular one is a variegated form and um, it's very attractive. Could be a great thing for a little winter interest, I think. The spice bush. Now this is one that's native, um, not uncommon in our area, especially in wet woods or damp places but we should be appreciating this because it's a really cool plant. It's got a very spicy kind of fragrance to it when you scratch the twigs. And you can see in that pic, the large picture there, you can't really see the foliage, uh, the flowers too well. It's not flashy, it's very subtle, but it does have these yellow flowers on it very soon. And it is a great native plant. It has some nice yellow fall color. So if you have kind of an edge of the woods and again, a very uh, good place for this would be a damp edge of the woods. This would be one to put there. We should talk about magnolias for just a minute. Of course, the star magnolia, this is very popular in the nursery trade. This has already been in bloom. I think it's kind of finishing up at this point, but you'll find this very easily. And magnolias are fairly easy plants to grow. Uh, once you plant them, you don't transplant them because they don't like that. But they're pretty tolerant of a lot of different conditions. Would like to have full sun for the most part and will reward you with a good flower display most years. Sometimes they get zapped by the frost, of course, um, but actually this year they've looked pretty good for a long time. And the star, I think, is the earliest of the bunch to bloom, followed quickly by the saucer, which has uh, larger petals on it, um, or maybe they're sepals, I should be careful about that. But this has got um, kind of more of a clunky appearance, I think. It's a little bit taller, it's a little bit coarser. Still a very attractive plant, and when one's in flower, it's like, Wow, look at that. But of course, it only lasts for maybe a few days to about a week and a half. But my favorite magnolia is this one. I have this in my yard. It's called Butterflies Hybrid Yellow Magnolia. It has very yellow flowers. And I was kind of skeptical. Yeah, it's going to have yellow flowers. Well, it really is yellow flowers. I have this out by the road. I have people call me and stop at my house saying, what is that yellow tree? Extremely easy to grow. This thing is really um, taken off. It's going to be, I would think it's going to be everything of 20, 25 feet tall. Um, and it, it's a very good grower, very easy grower. It's out there by the salt, no problems. Uh, one that you don't see a lot of is a native magnolia, Magnolia virginiana, the sweet bay, very large white flowers, but these bloom after the leaves appear. So this is a little bit later into June probably, not very commonly seen, but attractive and worth planting if you can find one. And I also have this one in my yard, the big leaf magnolia. This is an oddity, not for everybody. If you want a coarse leaf, a huge leaf, kind of a tropical effect, uh, this is the magnolia for you. It has very sporadic white flowers, usually not heavily flowered, and the flowers are large, kind of clunky, and they smell kind of strange. So it's not uh, the same as the other magnolias, but for the magnolia con connoisseur out there, you might want one of those. Uh, crab apples, I won't talk about too much other than to say there's a lot of nice ones out there and go on the internet and research disease resistant crab apples before you buy one. Because we see crab apples that have diseases such as apple scab and cedar apple rust. All July, August and September, I am on the phone and on my computer answering questions about crab apples that lose their leaves due to diseases. So if you don't want that to happen to yours, you go on the internet, you do a little research and Google disease resistant crab apples. There's one link there that was University of New Hampshire that had a really great list of the ones that are better. So only buy a disease resistant crab apple. Uh, one that you won't find, this is an oddball, 
if you want to do your homework and search one out, that would be really cool. Parodia. This is a plant from Iran. Um, it's a very tough plant, very urban tolerant plant. You've got, you can see it's got a very attractive shape there. It's got a very small sort of pink flower to it. I only know of one of these in the entire county at RPI. And um, I can tell you where it is if you want to go visit it. So again, for somebody that really wants something interesting, unique, this is one that you read about, you don't see a whole lot. I did put Philadelphus in there. Some people would say, ah, that's too common. But there are some good new ones here I have listed. Um, Belle Etoile, Manitou de Hermine, Cibale, sounds French to me. Um, some of these are some of the better ones. I have uh, mock orange in my yard, the old fashioned types. They're very large kind of shrubs, kind of clunky, uh, probably eight feet tall, but when they flower, man, they are incredible. Sweet smelling and covered with white flowers. So some of these newer varieties might be worth checking out because mock orange is tough as nails. This will survive drought, um, full sun, probably not great soil, somewhat deer resistant at least, so it could be a tough character um, if you have a tough place. Um, cherries again are going to be flowering or are flowering now. Lots, of, lots to choose from. Try to find disease resistant cherries because some of these have some disease issues and insect issues. One that I've been told uh, is better than most is called Accolade. I don't grow this myself, but this has got a lovely pink flower to it. You can see it's flowering in early spring. And the two parents here, Subhertella and Sargentii, are some of the better uh, cherries as well. Prunus Subhertella, its cousin is the Weeping Higgin cherry, which is again another good cherry. Uh, be very careful, don't fall in love with cherries and buy one on impulse. Make sure you do some research on them because there's a lot of kind of lousy cherry trees out there that are being sold. So uh, watch for that. Another oddity here, I just kind of love this one. It's called the Royal Azalea. It's a rhododendron and it's a deciduous rhododendron. You don't see this very often at all, but it's got a very lovely pink flower to it. And the pink flower is um, blooming there as the new foliage is coming out. You can see in the other picture there, it's got red fall color. So it's going to lose all its foliage. It's not going to get winter damage, but yet you're going to have a rhododendron, aka an azalea. So it's a very cool plant, kind of tall though, probably, you know, six feet, eight feet tall. It could be kept smaller, but again, for the connoisseur, this would be one to find and see, search out. Um, it's also pretty soil tolerant. It doesn't really need the low pH that most other rhododendrons need. Um, now this one probably isn't for everybody, but I tend to like it because I tend to like weird plants. Uh, this is sumac. Now a lot of people would say, why are you going to grow sumac in your garden? Well, sumac is a native plant, right? And we should be embracing our native plants. This is a little bit fancier than some of our other uh, sumacs because it's got this lacy leaf, the ciniata. So um, cut leaf staghorn sumac, um, this very cut leaf got a fine texture foliage, but the plant itself is kind of coarse. I have this in my garden and um, it'll grow up in a clump. It'll be there for a couple of years, then I'll either get rid of it or I'll want to put something else there and I cut it down and another one pops up. So it's not invasive, I would say, but it may spread a little bit, but you can control it. And you can see in the lower picture there, there's a golden leafed cut leaf staghorn sumac. That is kind of a very classy plant if you can appreciate it. And I'll never forget my sumac story. I went to England one time in the early 1990s and a man said to me, you must be from America. And I said, yes. And I said, how did you know that? And he said, could you wear giant white sneakers? Because that's what Americans wore at the time. And he said, my favorite plant comes from your country. And I said, you know, what is it? He said, the sumac, because it gets this fantastic, fall color. And at that time, nobody in our country appreciated sumac. So the Brits are a little ahead of us on that, although we are appreciating our native plants more and more. And here's some pictures of this flaming sumac color in the fall time. So search it out. It's kind of cool. Um, master gardeners really like this plant, so I put it in here for them. This is Stewardia, um, a Japanese plant, Asian plant. 
gets wonderful bark. You can see in that picture there, this very uh, attractive exfoliating bark in these beautiful patterns of beiges and browns and grays. Uh, when it gets older, it gets fantastic fall color in the lower picture. And it also gets a white camellia-like flower. So it gets that name pseudo camellia. Now, people that have these say they're not that hard to grow. I've seen kind of miserable stewardias though. So again, this would be one I would want to put it in good soil. It would like mostly sun, but maybe a little part afternoon shade to protect it a little bit. Some people succeed very well with this one. I haven't grown it, but I've been with master gardeners on field trips. And when we see one of these in flower, they get very excited about it. So I put this in there for them. Uh, the lilacs we'll just touch on very briefly. We all know Syringa vulgaris, the common lilac, but also remember there's many other lilacs. The late lilac blooms after the common lilac, so you can extend your season and have lilacs for several weeks in the uh, springtime. So I have late lilacs on my, in my garden. I think they're fantastic. You can see these are blooming. Oh, when the foliage is a little bit more developed, they come in all the lilac colors. So look for Syringa villosa, and you'll get later blooming lilacs. And of course, the Japanese tree lilac, this has been one that's been used as street trees. Uh, it has a white flower on it, kind of a little bit later, uh, probably in the late spring or the very early summer. These don't smell good, so don't think you're gonna have a beautiful smelling tree, but it's a tough tree. It's a very urban tolerant tree, and it gets white flowers on it, maybe oh, I don't know, 20, 25 feet tall at the most, maybe a little even shorter than that. So it's kind of interesting. And then I'll finish up here with the viburnums. Now, viburnums used to be some of my favorite plants uh, because they were shrubs that were tough, didn't have any insect problems, had white flowers or pink flowers in the springtime usually, and some of them would get fantastic fruit in the fall. But then along came this terrible thing called the viburnum leaf beetle. And the viburnum leaf beetle came over to our country or to, to New York specifically through Canada. And the viburnum leaf beetle uh, feeds both as an adult beetle, you can see down there in the white background picture, as well as a larva. And this will just destroy the foliage of your viburnum. So viburnums have gone sort of out of favor to some degree but you can still plant them if you research the resistant viburnums. So I had viburnums um, at my, in my garden called the European cranberry bush viburnum, fantastic plant. They were eaten to death by these uh, viburnum leaf beetles and I had to get rid of those, but I still have other viburnums. And resistant viburnums include this one, the double file viburnum, this is probably, my, this is mine, it's been there 22 years probably. And you can see this is a large shrub, there's more compact varieties of this if you want a smaller one or you can prune these. But you can see it's got this sort of tiered branching effect to it, a very white uh, flower coming out in the next couple of weeks. Just absolutely gorgeous plant, uh, the double file viburnum. And this is growing next to a driveway in kind of a shady place, not a great environment, so it's a pretty tough plant. And it's resistant to that uh, viburnum leaf beetle. Now, this is another one I grow. This is my um, lantanophyllum viburnum, or I call this leather leaf viburnum. It's a whitish, uh, pinkish flower on it. You can see it's flowering well in that picture to the left. Not particularly attractive as far as scent goes, but tough as nails. And this one is evergreen. And these are pictures I took of it um, just the other day. You can see I need to prune it a little bit. It's getting a little shaggy. But it's got this wonderful evergreen foliage. And how many broadleaf evergreens do we have in this climate? A lot of the rhododendrons look terrible by this time in the spring uh, because of winter damage. This thing is so tough, the leaves don't discolor. You have this wonderful glossy green foliage on it. So I really like the leather leaf viburnum. It's not popular, but I think it's a really cool plant. And this last one here is called T. viburnum. This is one that gets a pinkish flower, a whitish flower, I should say, in the springtime, but it really is grown for its fall uh, berries. So there's a lot of these viburnums, or several of these viburnums that you can grow for their fruit. The T. viburnum, viburnum sativum, 
is one of these. You can see it's got kind of a wide ranging habit to it. It's not a small plant, but it's got fantastic um, fruit on it late summer into the fall. So that could be a great way to extend your gardening season. So um, that's my spiel there. We only went about six minutes over, which is fantastic. And again, if you'd like to sign up for more of these webinars, send us an email. Uh, it's dhc3 at cornell.edu. And um, look for our plant of the week and our gardening update um, on our Facebook page. So let me stop sharing here and see if we have any questions.